Welcome to API Conversations. This is Paul Carr, and this is part two of my conversation with Eric Wojciechowski, recorded initially on the 24th of January, 2020. Let's just jump right in. I just, you know, saw my doctor a month ago and I'm having just below my knee, I'm having what could be a shin splint, could be some kind of damage or something like that. It's just nonstop pain. Yeah. And, you know, he sent me, you know, I'm going to a specialist to check it out. And uh, I, I, he said something about, um, I don't know, taking it easy or something. And I, and I just sort of blurted out, uh, you know, I don't mind going part cyborg. <laughs> <laughs> Because, you know, as you get older, your your life is going to, you're going to have to augment your body the older you get. It's well, just you know, the, way the that phrase that stuck with me since, well, I was, when I was a kid was, we have the technology, we can make him better. <laughs> yeah, the Bionic Man. Yeah, well, I, I was like, what, 14 or 12 when that came out? And, and uh, I, I just, yeah. yeah, we have the technology, we can make me better. That's right. Yeah. So, and, you know, I, and mean, I know I'm 61 and I need to be made better. <laughs> well, I'm turning 50 in April. So <laughs> I yeah. got to have some. Oh, something. I wish I were that young. But uh, yeah. trust, trust so, me, when you get 60, you'll, you'll find 50 to be quite, quite, 50's a, one. quite, yeah. quite good. <laughs> so, so when it comes to like artificial intelligence, I think you're right. I think that we're already <laughs> augmenting ourselves and we're, we're now even starting to fool around with the fertilized egg and messing around with the genes while it's still in the womb possibly eradicating diseases and fixing things before the child's even born that's a yeah. form of artificial creation yeah it, well i mean you know, a chinese scientist went to, just went to jail for that but uh yeah <laughs> yeah cloning um but, but you know, know that, so, but i think he may be there's gonna be anytime there's a major turnover there's a lot of casualties right uh yeah. The, the industrial revolution, the agricultural revolution, mm -hmm. uh, the information age. There's always a lot of people who are made to suffer, um, not always by choice. Uh, when we went to yeah. the industrial revolution, a lot of people had to go live in cities and 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 were miserable there, uh, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> had very difficult working conditions, and uh, you know. Because they were coming in from the farm and where where life is had been stable for ten thousand years, and then before that, ten, mm. go back ten thousand years, right? The farm was the new thing. And, yeah, yeah. And the hunter gatherers were miserable living on farms. Yeah, and, and, right. and suffered yep. for for centuries before. Well, think about. Yeah, talking about something that's even more mo like more current. Um, I, I, you know, like I, I mentioned, my kids are going on 14 and 12 and I will not encourage either of them to try to become truck drivers because artificial intelligence will probably take over transportation in their lifetime. Probably, so, yeah, I, I think that's reasonable. Uh, yeah. Most yeah, so, people um, I know want to be truck drivers are, are well into their 50s or 50s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's some jobs that machines are just going to do for us. I, I just I see that happening. Yeah, we got a lot of problems now, and people can't foresee it in the future. But uh, I mean, we've already got planes. Planes practically take off, fly, and land on their own. The pilot's practically there in case there's a problem. <laughs> you yeah. know, I, I realized this back in um, the year 2000, January 2000, 20 years ago, almost to the day. Uh, I remember being in, um, there's a layover, where was I, Missouri, I think, a layover in Missouri, and it was about 11 o'clock at night, and we were on the plane, and we're on the runway, and we're not taking off, and the pilot comes on over, remember, this is 20 years ago, he says, we're going to turn the plane off real quick and turn it back on, and then we'll get started, and my first <laughs> thought was, you're rebooting the plane? <laughs> You know, like I never really thought of it, but you're like, I'm like, is it running Windows 95 up there? Because we're we're done for if that's the case. He probably, he probably called tech support. They say, yeah, turn it off and turn it back on again. Yeah, that's the <laughs> advice I give people. You know, turn it off and turn, you know, that, that fixes 90% of the problems right away. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, for, that was 20 years ago. And today, computers are even more involved to the point where 
you know, I mean, there's a lot of automation going on. Yeah. I mean, even the, even in this phone call right now uh, right. That, that, that we're talking, you know, through through the machines, um, the speakers and the networks that it's going through. And, you know, it's pretty amazing. All the stuff that goes on behind the scenes. Right. And, and I, uh, you know, I, I have a. Uh, um... The, the pace of change is something we usually get wrong, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, for example, self-driving cars, uh, back three years ago when my oldest was learning to drive, I thought, okay, what are people saying about self-driving cars? Cause I just don't want her to learn. I don't want to deal with this. <laughs> and, and, and yeah. uh, they say, Oh, five years. Well, you know, no, yeah. no, uh, not going to happen. Uh, yeah. but, uh, eventually there will be uh, you know it's going to take oh sure now that's very narrow ai that's just dealing with one specific domain of un of knowledge uh but mm -hmm. i've recently listened to an interview with gary marcus who's one of the ai people you know ai thinkers and he he's saying yeah the thing is the car uh mm. doesn't understand even basic common sense <laughs> yeah it, it, well, it, yeah it, and uh it doesn't have common sense, so it, it we have to train it on every single possible case it could come across. Uh, yeah, I mean the difference between uh, like say a car and say an airplane or a train is a train's got a track, so it doesn't have to deviate, and it crosses certain points, but gates can be down. Um, it only has to really worry about what's in front of it. it. Doesn't have to worry about the sides. An airplane's in the air. The chances of collision, even without navigation equipment, are probably pretty slim. There's a lot of space up there, but it only has a few things to worry about. But a car yeah. has so much to worry about. Other cars to to the left and to the right, intersections, um, people crossing, jaywalking, like like the question people is, being idiots, which is and yeah. people just being idiots. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I live in stuff. Maryland, so that that's the most common problem. But <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah. So a, a self driving car, if somebody comes out in the middle of the road and it has to swerve or slam on its brakes or keep going it has to make this decision is my passenger's life more important than the person i'm going to hit is a is a machine able to do that not now well but it's that gonna probably have to that. probably yeah i mean those kinds of conditions are very rare but uh i mean i think if we yeah. get to if we get to the point where we have we can show clearly that the rate of the rate of fatal accidents goes down by a, a large margin. Mm -hmm. uh, then that will become they don't be, probably become illegal to drive the car yourself. But <laughs> yeah, well that's true. I mean, it could actually come down to that too. Yeah, but there, there's a accident. transition period. There's that uncanny valley between cars that can drive themselves sort of and yeah. people being jerks to to self driving cars. <laughs> And, and, oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There might be that sticker on back, you know, the one that currently says <clears throat> um, "caution" or you know, "please be patient." Uh, new driver, just student uh, driver on board. There might be that sticker that says "caution, no driver on board." <laughs> uh, please be patient. We're testing out this new AI, and there's going to be the goofball that's going to test it. Yeah, I mean, there's going to be the result. They get. Yeah, people will cut it off. They will do whatever they can to to. Yeah, yeah, to, and and. That's exactly what should happen in a testing track, but not on uh, the highway. Which yeah, you need you need track. like uh, let's hire fifteen assholes to come up with different, <laughs> different yeah, ways. Yeah, exactly. Let, let, let's hire some sixteen-year-old idiots and let them play their music as loud as they want. In fact, let's give them some whiskey, and we're gonna really <laughs> test this thing. <laughs> yeah. Right. No good whiskey. Just stick with Southern Comfort. <laughs> Southern Comfort, yeah, something, whatever, just to make the people do bad judgment things and see what the AI does. Yeah, it's funny. I just had this conversation with Micah Hanks about AI, and I, and he was asking me about, um, you know, where I saw the future going. And the thing is, I, you know, I, I read the horror stories, and then I read the stories that said, no, you don't need to listen to that. It's never the programmers who are talking that way. And I don't know. I, I have no idea because once again, that's not my field. Yeah, well, I, I, I think even it's... the programmers don't really understand the pace that things will move at. Uh, yeah. In fact, they probably they're too close to the problem. Uh, yeah, and, and you know, I, you read history, and it's like, oh, you know, uh, you'll read the complaints that a train will never go more than sixty miles an hour because your skin will fly off. 
you know, uh, or that the well, sound barrier will never be broken, or that rockets yeah. can't really operate in a vacuum. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and things like that, and it's going to be the worst possible thing ever, and it's not. So, yeah. I don't. I, first of all, I don't see artificial intelligence stopping. Uh, research won't stop, even if for some reason the United States and maybe. Um, NATO or whatever decided we're done with artificial intelligence. We're sticking with what we got because the danger is too high. Somebody somewhere is going to do it. There's always a kid, oh, smart yeah, kid in yeah. the basement. That, that, that sounds like an interesting, interesting novel to write, like an like <clears throat> underground AI, right? <laughs> yeah. I, well, I wouldn't be surprised if it's out there, but, you know, I mean. Oh, it is. It is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So even if the United States said no more, China's not going to do that, you no. know. India is not going to do that. Even if they decide to do that, there's there's going to be some brilliant. Well, per- the I'm military applications are just too. Oh yeah. Tempting, right? So oh, no, nobody's going to stop. Uh, yeah, it's not going to stop. So we may as well just admit it's coming. And uh, what it's going to look like in the end, I, I don't know. I I'm not a futurist. <laughs> yeah, I well, tell. I think that that uh, um, the problem of general general AI is very far from being solved. Uh, mm. The prob- the problems of specific narrow AI, uh, like for example, chess obviously solved, right? Other, oh yeah. It, other, I, yep. Other very finite rule games like Go solved. Yep. Uh, yep. Nobody's built a robot soccer player that's better than Leo Messi. Uh, yeah. <laughs> or yep. even 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 ten, one tenth is good. Uh, you know, and, and uh, nobody's built. Uh, and they're really struggling with self-driving cars, although I think they'll get there in the next decade or so. Uh, well, if, you, if you had told me just 20 years ago that I would be <laughs> talking to you on this device that's got more computing power than all the computers that took man to the moon in 1969, and that the majority of the time I'd be using this to do nothing more than look up silly YouTube videos, <laughs> I probably would have laughed at you. But this and right now I'm talking on a Samsung Galaxy 10. I don't work for them. This is an advertisement. My point is that um, th- this is just this is amazing. I never would have saw this coming. So just because I'm not smart enough to think about it, uh, of it doesn't mean somebody else isn't going to. Yeah. Uh, Elon Musk comes to mind. I, Elon Musk, I joke, is literally just one bad decision away from becoming the first real life James Bond villain. <laughs> Be- because he's got his own rocket ships. I mean, he's Moonraker. He's Drake, Drax, all, if he wants to be. Yeah. He's got his own rockets that come and go. He's launching. He's got his own cars. He's launching them into space. He's tunneling underground. I mean, tunneling underground is a Bond villain activity. <laughs> yeah, though that's the primary one. You have to have yeah. an underground yeah. layer. <laughs> an underground. He's got an underground lair. He's uh, got his own car company, his own rocket ships. He's he's literally one choice away. From, and he's working on it? he's working on yeah. uh, Neuralink, which is like a, a computer inter computer brain interface. Oh, and yeah, and he's also got flamethrowers. <laughs> so so he's 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 literally just he just has to make the choice to become the world's first Bond villain, and we got it. Yeah. So um, <laughs> it, you know, it's really just a matter of people smarter. With the money, and uh, we'll have things, you know. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, it, yeah. It, <laughs> I, I kind of actually, well, I have a a, a, a non fanboy admiration for for uh, Elon Musk, but <laughs> yeah, uh, the fanboy, I, I, the fan. I don't like fanboys of any stripe, but <laughs> uh, <clears throat> yeah, I, I'm a fan of Musk in just the sense that I really like the fact that he's taking his smarts and his money and he's just doing some fantastic stuff like you could be you could take your money and you could just be like a kardashian and he could be but he's taking his money and he's got he's going further than i mean we've got self launching and returning rockets the fact that his rockets can land on a platform in the middle of the ocean and come down standing up like they took off. I don't know how that's done. That's magic. That's angels to me. <laughs> I have no idea how they're well, doing it's, that. It's, it's feasible, but nobody else thought of doing that before. Yeah. Uh, I mean, every, everybody said, you know, there's no way because you want enough fuel. And they never really ran the numbers. They really never really mm-hmm. looked hard at it. And he had his people said, let's look hard at this. And mm-hmm. the other thing about him is he's a very good talent spotter. He 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 knows 
how to bring people in that can get this stuff mm-hmm. done. And uh, he's never hired me, which is is major flaw. But because uh, well, I always reach out. Yeah. Yeah, well, <laughs> Reach I, I think if you're, you know, at my age, it's really hard to get a job at a new space company. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> not, I'm not claiming age discrimination, by the way. I'm just saying that. that <laughs> right. It's just the opportunity hasn't arisen. They, they just, they just. Well, I mean, it probably is age discrimination, but I don't. Uh, I, I'm not necessarily opposed to that. Uh, you yeah. know, because most guys my age. And gals are not looking for new ideas, and they, he needs people to look, look for new ideas. And, and uh, but yeah, the uh, the idea, we, yeah, you know what? We can bring a rocket, we can bring a rocket booster back, mm-hmm. and it will save yeah. money. Nobody even had even. There's no glimmer of that idea anywhere. And yeah, and that's what's fa- that's what's fascinating is like we've had rockets since. Um... Oh well, World War II, and we used yeah. rockets, Werner Ver- von Braun's rockets, the V two prototypes, took us to the moon, and yeah, like you said, you know, NASA from that time on, the seventies and eighties and nineties, they weren't considering they they end up going with the space shuttle, and here's Musk going, now nah, we're gonna go back to the rockets, and we're going to land them and reuse them, you know, um, so it took somebody completely outside of that school. Sure. To come up with it, you know, and then yeah, to but it, it, it's really, uh, I mean, reusability is not a new idea, but but reusability of a vertically launched rocket uh, that doesn't have wings on it, you know, that that which yeah. which makes it yeah. a lot cheaper and a lot easier to reproduce, uh, is mm. uh, is a clever idea, and and the fact is, there's nothing in physics that says you can't do that. Uh, there's no law of nature that says it's impossible. It's just People literally had not considered the possibility. And well, the, yeah, the closest I could I could even think of with my non non expertise in this field, I could take a stick and I could throw it up in the air straight, and it's never going to come down like that, ever. It's never going to come down. Well, if it, if it had a modern garden system, it would. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's the point. Is is that I just my point, and the reason why I even bring it up is, I always think just because I'm not smart enough to think about it or to figure it out doesn't mean somebody else isn't. Right. Um. So just because I can't think of something doesn't mean there ain't smarter people out there. And that I'm always impressed when I see the new app. Like I was one of the things that recently impressed me in the past couple of years is the app Shazam. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Oh yeah, it recognizes tunes. Yeah. It's amazing. I have used it in restaurants. I've used it in bars. Uh, I've used it when I'm watching a live band going, I like this song. Who is this? And I hold up Shazam and it tells me. And now I've got it and I can go seek that song. Um, In fact, it's how I discovered I'm a Taylor Swift fan. (laughs) (laughs) Because I would hear these songs. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I would hear these songs and I go, that's kind of good. Who is this? And I go, oh, okay, it's Taylor Swift. And after like the third or fourth time when it turned out to be Taylor Swift, I was like, I'm just going to have to admit I'm a Taylor Swift fan. (laughs) Because I'm I'm liking this stuff and never even knew it was her. (laughs) Not that there's anything wrong with that. (laughs) Right. So, yeah. Uh, well, yeah. Well, so I'm constantly amazed by uh, discoveries in the human mind and so forth. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, if what I found is that you go to any country in the world, mm. right? It doesn't matter where it is. There are people there who are incredibly talented and clever. Mm-hmm. It's just a question of how their efforts are encouraged and direct and uh, channeled. Uh, you know, if it's to cybercrime, Cybercrime is an easy way for them mm-hmm. to be clever, right? Uh, well, yeah. Well, yeah. Simply look at look at it this way. Um, sort of along those lines, you could you take a look at some of the best drug dealers. They're running an amazing business. They got things. They got the books well done and perfect. The employees are falling in line. If they had only applied themselves into a legitimate business, they could be the next Bill Gates. <laughs> so yeah, well, I don't really want that. But... <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, well, p- pick your pick your. You could be the next Elon Musk. Pick, okay. pick your hero. <laughs> well, there, yeah, there, there is an Elon Musk in every country. He just, yeah, that's right. Does, who doesn't have the incentives, or doesn't have the support, mm-hmm. or the uh, the infrastructure to make it happen? Yeah. Uh, the, uh, I mean, you 
pick pick any country. Uh, there's somebody there who has the talent and the energy to do it. And yeah, what they're great. probably doing is is running a porn site. <laughs> well, yes, yes. In fact, I'm, I'm convinced that the reason we have the speeds of the internet we have today are because of video games and pornography. <laughs> when I was in my computer classes back in the uh, year 2000, I was going for my Microsoft certifications. And uh, we were discussing the first websites, the first inklings of the Internet that appeared uh, at the time Bill Clinton was president. Uh, so this had been like 94, yeah, 92. Yeah, I remember that well, yeah. And there were 10 when he became president. So that would have been 92. And one of them was IBM. And the joke is the other nine were porn sites. <laughs> And that may be true, but yeah, I think I think uh, pornography and video uh, are the reasons why we probably have the speeds of the internet we have today. And Netflix is taking up what fifty percent of all internet traffic these I days. Know, or fifty percent. Like yeah, there's a lot of yeah. It's huge in terms of the number of bits transmitted. Well, between yeah. between Netflix and YouTube and now Disney Plus and video streaming services, yeah, it's it's probable that uh, some form of video entertainment is taking up most of it. I'm going to guess that anyhow. So, yeah, and, and that, uh, you know, and if you'd ask somebody in 1985, what's it going to be? You know, what, what, what is, what's oh, going to yeah. dominate the internet? Oh, yeah, physics data. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, yeah, ask, ask me even in the late 90s, what's your email killer? Well, I never thought, I thought email would be the future of communication. I don't get much email. Other than articles that I publish that the editor sends to me for review and acceptance uh, or um, spam or a bill from my bank notifying me I have a bill or an Amazon order. That's about it. But all of my personal communications are nowadays Twitter or Facebook or things like Skype or texting. I mean, texting even. Texting has pretty much replaced email. You know, you, I used to send an email back in the 90s, one sentence, you know. My, kid, my kids won't use email. I have to text them. Yeah, <laughs> right. So think about that. That's so. That's really only a, a difference in twenty years. Maybe not even twenty years. Maybe in ten years. You know. So yeah. what's going to be? What's going to be the form of communication nowadays? It's a, you know the funny thing is nowadays a big thing is FaceTime, right? So my eleven year old going on twelve, she has an iPhone and she uses FaceTime. So she's constantly talking to her friends who can see everything behind her. And she's walking through the house, and I've constantly got to be very aware of this. <laughs> I've got my daughter talking to her friends, and I got to make sure that there's nothing that could be questionable in the background. <laughs> right? Yeah. You, know, yeah, and you, you don't know. You don't know where else that day those, those videos are ending up either. Well, yeah. Yeah. You have this. You have this. Um, uh, this sense of privacy in your own home. You know. Um, well, but nowadays you've got people uh nowadays you've got facetime and walking around and video conferencing and you're in the background well no that we, we pay we pay amazon to have an alexa which yeah, we don't know what they're doing with that right and that's that's we, right we pay google to have a google mini and we don't know what they're doing with that uh, that's absolutely correct that's right and it's it's kind of one reason why i like using a vpn on my phone and my my it's just one of those things where yeah. I kind of like that. Nobody knows. Well, what I'm I've, doing. Been, I've been to places like <laughs> Egypt where they uh -huh. need to do that or they, so they don't get arrested. <laughs> well, that's true. Sometimes I'll go to YouTube and I want to watch something as simple as a music video and it'll say it is not available in your, in your uh, country. So I use my VPN and I connect from Canada or a different country and all of a sudden it's there. Huh? You know, so, yeah, because because the laws are different. So this might be a copyright issue on YouTube, and instead of YouTube taking it down, they just prohibit it because it's not necessarily illegal. It's just illegal in your country. Uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, to avoid yeah. So if you're traveling, especially if you're going to a place, if you were to get into Iran or something, you might be locked out of a lot. Use a VPN, and now you're you know you're free to to roam around. I like the VPN because I just yeah I just don't have to worry about any kind of censorship based on that. So I just saw something today. Was that you, uh, Henry Rollins? Walking around Iran with a yes, a hard yes, drive. That, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I uh, I was watching one of his presentations at a university. Uh, it was probably about five years old, and he was basically talking about how he likes to go around the world and just meet people. So he doesn't go to um, hot spots uh, like like tourist areas. He'll 
get off the plane, get in a cab and say, take me 10 miles that way and drop me off. And he starts walking and he'll just stop and shake people's hand. Hi, I'm Henry Rollins. I'm, I'm from the United States. I'm here to meet you. I want to just meet what's going on. How, you know, how do you live here? What's your favorite food? What's a good restaurant? And he just likes to get to know the people of that country and sort of it's sort of he's sort of an ambassador of the of the average person. And he said that in Iran, they're limited, you know, and he said he goes, if I got you a hard drive, he was telling the story of a guy he met on the street. If I got you a hard drive full of this music, this Western music. What do you think you could do with it? And the guy was like, well, I could probably share it with my friends and stuff. So he did. He brought over a, like 32 gigs worth of music and handed him the hard drive. And for all he knows, it's still being passed around copied. <laughs> so, huh. so yeah, I mean, there's, yeah. yeah, it's great. So, so I felt like tweeting that out. I'm like, oh, that's really a great idea. You know, good ideas. Like I think about that just as, you know, being a writer. There may be some of my things that I've written that aren't going to be available somewhere. So how would I get them out there? Well, yeah. You know, I could do that real easy. Just ask me if it's prohibited in your country. I'll find a way of getting you my book <laughs> if you want to read yeah. it. It's I don't know cool. if you're familiar with the uh, the cartoon Jesus and Mo. Uh, I am. Yes, I am. Yep. Yeah, yep. they have a, a, a. If you look at their page, they said, "If this is blocked in your country, go to this." <laughs> Here's yeah. what you do. Uh, but, oh, be, yeah. but be careful. Don't get in trouble. <laughs> oh yeah yeah if i i i don't think i've written i can't think of anything that i could have. well maybe i could have i've written some critiques of religion perhaps <laughs> i could see that being banned somewhere but yeah well, i mean if you if you really were interested in my yeah. stuff all you have to do is hit me up i'm sure i could find a way of getting it to you <laughs> yeah. well jesus jesus the mo has has a, a character who's the prophet muhammad right and it's yes depicted so <laughs> yeah which is forbidden in some countries so uh that's right. We know what happened to um, um oh boy, why did I just blank out? Paris, twenty fifth January. Uh, Charlie 20th. Hebdo. Charlie Hebdo, thank you. I blanked out uh, on that. Yes. Yeah. Very bad. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's pretty awful stuff. And then of course nine eleven. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but yeah, yeah I've, written, I've written critiques on religion, and I've written on politics, and I write fiction, and basically what I do is just I, I take a subject that interests me, and I decide what to do with it, you know? So, well, yeah, you know, I, I'm looking forward to the future here. Uh, hopefully you'll, you'll, uh, you're planning another novel or, uh, what I'm working on. Well, I'm working on, um, as far as fiction is concerned, I am working on, it's not really a follow up to chasing disclosure, but what I decided to do was since I do really enjoy the subject of UFOs and the ancient astronaut theory, which is now pretty much ancient aliens theory. I like it in the sense for fiction. I don't. I don't really think there's. I'm an extreme skeptic that there's any actual phenomenon going on. But without getting into that, as far as what's what I'm going to write next, I was thinking of writing a collection of short stories that take place in the universe I created in the book Chase and Disclosure. I see. So I could write several short stories. Some some stories maybe 10 to 20 pages long and some might just be one page long i figured a collection of short stories that go along with it would be better than a sequel i i don't like the idea i find that when an author does a sequel it's only because they just can't let their characters go <laughs> and i get it they become part of your family your imaginary friends you can't let them go um, I don't want to fall into that trap. I, you know, I'm not going to be the trilogy guy. <laughs> Every author seems to dis seems to want to have a trilogy. I, I just don't feel the need for that. I feel there's different stories that can be told. But since I like the UFO subject so much, I figure what I'll do is just put put together a collection. I don't know, maybe ten, maybe yeah. two hundred pages, yeah. and uh, and I'm going to call that one Chasing Magic. And oh. if you remember the end, if you remember the end of Chasing Disclosure, you might know why. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have to go back and um, remind myself, but yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you know, I, uh, um, yeah. Of course, a lot of trilogies get started. If somebody writes a really long novel, and the the publisher has split this up in three books. <clears throat> well, if that's the case, then I get it. Then that was how not... Tolkien Tolkien really kicked this whole yeah. trilogy thing off, right? He'd ri actually yeah. written the whole thing, and and the publisher yeah. said too long. <laughs> and, and I get it. You know, Tol Tolkien's one of those writers I can't get into. I read The Hobbit in junior high, but I, I've tried Fellowship of the Ring twice now, and I can't get more than about 70 pages in because I'm a minimalist writer. In other words, I, I let the reader do most of the heavy lifting. 
like when I say you're, you're, the character's in a doctor's office, I don't feel the need to describe everything about that because we've all been to one. So you sort of fill in the blanks in your head. You can create that scene. I feel that writing dialogue is probably more important than describing the, the seat he's sitting on and the doctor's stethoscope. Um, Tolkien, on the other hand, he'll talk about the elves marching in the woods, and it's 10 pages of the way the wind blew through the trees and the way the sound of the song was that they sang. And it's not good enough to just tell you they were singing, here's the lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need that. I, you know, I Give me a simple setting and then get the characters talking to each other. That's, that's really the best yeah, thing to do. Yeah, well, it's not for everybody, yeah. Although it's made yeah. some very successful films, but... Uh. Oh, certainly. I mean, yeah, I'm I'm just talking about my personal preference. Uh, you know, obviously. Yeah, uh, the I, I, rings... bur- I burned through that whole trilogy myself in like one one winter, but uh, yeah, it, it was uh, I found it entertaining. But you kind of have to get into that, yeah, that flow, where mm-hmm. yeah, you're letting Tokyo build the world around you. And, uh, yeah, if yeah, if you like that kind of detail, that's great. Tolkien's for you. Um, me, I'm a little bit different. Like one of the, one of my favorite novels, um, just by the way that it's written, is A Postman Always Rings Rings Twice. Um, what's great about it is, first of all, the title has nothing at all to do with the novel at all. There's no postman in it, and he's not ringing anything. The, the <laughs> t- title doesn't mean anything. And secondly, the book is all dialogue. You it takes place in like a hotel. And you would never even know it because it's all dialogue. You barely even know where the characters are. And it's pretty fascinating. Just just that alone. Uh, those two aspects alone. Like the title yeah. has nothing to do with it and it's pure dialogue. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. Well, so. uh, it's uh, – I've had you for almost two hours, so I'm going to let you go. But, oh, uh, okay. Great. Uh, Time uh, this may actually be a two-parter. We have so much material. Okay. Yeah. I, I hope we have material. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, if it, well, we can do it again. We'll Te- try it again. Technical has been. Yeah. Well, what, what I'd like to maybe we're going to start a uh, up a live thing, uh, an API live uh, thing where the, the listeners can interact with with the guest and the panel and so forth. And uh, that's probably not going to start until February or March, but of 2020 but okay. you know it, it the, the technology's there right we've got the <laughs> everybody yeah. everybody their dog is live streaming uh, so <laughs> we're gonna do it yeah, too. I talk, yeah i was you know i want to speaking along those lines i every year for the past couple of years i've wanted to attend like 20 conferences a year i want to go to psycon i want to go to skepticon i want to go to american atheist i want to go to the libertarian parties convention the state and the federal or, or national um, i want to go to ufo congress I, you know i got all these places i want to go right well the limitations are mainly time and money you know i right. don't have the money to go out to something like contact in the desert which between airfare, meals, hotel, and conference is going to be like $1,500 minimum, you know, and then other places that I want to go, like UFO Congress. I would love to just one time get to the UFO Congress to say that I did it. That is going to be minimum $1,500. With this type of technology, we don't really have to leave. We could, we could have guests do presentations virtually, and like you said, you could have an audience of thousands Asking questions in a chat room that the the presenter could then go back to or have a moderator picking out the quality ones um, and throw them at the presenter for the last 15 minutes. And, or, and then again, we're not even – we don't even have to worry about time. People could kind of come and go as they please. You could have it a worldwide thing. You could have presentations going on at 3 in the morning Eastern Standard because the guy's over in Dubai giving a presentation. Yeah, I actually, I'm in favor of that. Uh- <laughs> It, it yeah, would, but I it would mean, be it be uh it wouldn't be the any speaker that puts butts in seats sort of uh thing for if I was doing it. But uh, I mean, you well, know, it, it no, just, no, 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 Corey Good, no, no, David Wilcox. Oh God, no, <laughs> no, please no. No Jeremy no, I Corbell. Would, I would, <laughs> yeah, I would rather. Yeah, I I don't mind it being. I don't want to use the word nobody. Um, that sounds to me, but but like I've I've known a lot, talked to a lot of people on Twitter that. They don't have a book. They don't really have a blog, but they're good conversationalists and they know the topic. And sure. the only outlet that they've got is things they've written on Twitter. I'm like, you know what? If you just took a little bit of time, you could probably turn this into a 20 minute presentation. If it's something, if it's nothing more than just your, per, even your personal experiences, 
you know, I, I've met a number of people that claim that they've been contacted by entities. Okay, I'm not going to judge it. Tell me your story. I'd like to hear that. Maybe we could figure out what it is and maybe we won't, but it's still interesting, right? right? So, you know, if we could even put together some kind of a conference or something like that where we've got this little community that we built and it's like, hey, man, get to, let's all get together, tell your story, and uh, we'll put some notes together. And I don't know. Well, you're, <laughs> touching, you're touching on something I've I've – been one of my things which is uh the loud people are the problem part of the problem and the, the quiet well, people the quiet people never get a voice and no, we don't have to invite the loud people <laughs> the loud people are you know they, they get 99 percent of the bandwidth uh and yeah. they uh because they're self-promoters and mm -hmm. they uh know how to work the the system and yeah the quiet people like well one person i think of keith basterfield uh mm -hmm. the quiet australian researcher who's always coming up with these interesting documents uh right well yeah and then there's um uh what does he know, what does he go by the name of on on twitter blurry something blurry photos yeah that's kurt collins no blurry photos. yeah no not blurry photos uh blurry uh yeah i know who you're talking about uh okay i uh, kurt, I kurt can't collins yeah. Yeah. There, but there, there's there's several people that I don't know who they are in real life. They've got a handle, um, and then there's just some guys that that I just I don't necessarily interact all the time because I'm not I'm not the type to get into a, a Twitter battle. I'd rather have a conversation. Good idea. <laughs> don't get into Twitter battles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, because nothing gets so I never see anybody really changing their mind on social media. Um, but there's but there's some guys that have some really good. Even if they're just bouncing around ideas, what's what's the problem with? I mean, we're kind of doing that now, aren't we? Yeah. I kind of bounce around ideas in my book, my novel. You know, I'm sort of like yeah. I don't. I'm writing fiction, so I can't be, I can't be yelled at for being foolish because I know that I'm making it up for the sake of entertainment. But at the same time, when I take a look at how my book ended, I'm like, it's very possible somewhere along the way something like this could happen. <laughs> you know, it's it's reasonable. Um, well, bits of it well, have, right? <laughs> well, that yeah, that's true. But I mean, the the grand, the great grand conclusion. Um, well, I guess it just depends on the reading of the book. I'm, I might yeah. give away too much. I'll stop. <laughs> I think other people read the book and they can they can uh, let. They can contact you on Twitter and tell you what they think. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I, I mean, I've had some people do that offline. They're like, hey, could you tell me, was this really this and this really that? And um, most of the time I'd say, I don't know. <laughs> because the reason I left it vague was because I wanted it to be vague. And I didn't yeah. I didn't answer it for myself, so I can't answer it for you. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, you don't have to reify fiction. Fiction is uh, fiction. You know? <laughs> I, yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. I have people all the time saying, well, did Captain Card really say that? I, no. <laughs> right. Patrick Stewart is an actor. He says the lines that other people give him to say. You know? That's right. <laughs> and and yeah. some, some, guy, some people in a writer's room just figured out what they wanted him to say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Some, some of the things that I've come up with in, like, for instance, the ending of this particular book, the ending of Chase and Disclosure, like I said, I spent about a year writing the book. I couldn't figure out how I was going to end it. But I knew I did not want to cheat the reader by having a predictable ending. The ending I came up with was literally a surprise to me because when I thought of it, I felt I took the rest of the day to sort of take a walk around. Like I, I could barely sit in my seat. I had to wander around and go, do I want to do this? And I had to do some research to the um, to see if it was something that was believable. And then I talked to some authors without telling them how I was ending the book, telling them, asking them some things. And uh, I went with it. And like like you said, and even my own mother was like, I was sort of sad. <laughs> I was like, I, I've told a friend of mine this. She goes, Why don't you ever write happy endings? And I said, <laughs> Because be, because happy endings are boring. Everybody's got a happy ending. Uh, you know, why is Titanic so awesome? It's not a happy ending. <laughs> it's so good, though. <laughs> you know, I mean, we've got yeah. enough happy endings. I don't I, I want to write more of a realistic ending. And and she goes, well, you know, you could. In fact, one person who read my first novel, which also doesn't have so much of a happy ending. She goes, I'm pretending that didn't happen. I'm just going to pretend this happened. I said, OK, you do whatever you want because it's fiction anyhow. So, <laughs> that, Yeah, that's fine. You know, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Uh, whatever, but 
So yeah, I remember being a kid and and I can't remember what happened. It was watching some TV show and it had a really bitter ending for one of the characters. I was just mm-hmm. crying, yeah. yeah, and thinking, yeah, uh, it might have been a dog. I I can't remember. You know, <laughs> uh, the dog died. You know, the dog shouldn't die. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, you know, and, and that. And I still feel that. I feel a little bit of that pang when, when mm. a character has has a, some suffering to do. It, you know. Well, look at look at Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones. In in fact, even The Walking Dead for some time there, the television show, um, and, and Game of Thrones, the book and the the show, um, they've changed the game. You can't. You, in my opinion, they have set a new bar um, as writer as a writer of fiction. You can't be predictable anymore uh, because that just bores the audience. Game of Thrones at least spoiled me. Um, and I was watching that during and even after writing Chase and Disclosure. But I realized that, you know, you can't really be predictable anymore. For instance, I love Indiana Jones. I love those movies. But I know that no matter what kind of danger he gets into in the movie, that nothing's going to happen to him. He's not going to die. I just know that. I know he's going to get out. I also know the same thing when I'm watching a Spider-Man movie or a superhero movie. And I mean, granted, some things happen, but they always find a way to bring the character back. Like the character dies and it's sad. The next movie, they find a way to time travel or something and they bring him back. So they're never really gone and there's never really a sense of loss. Game of Thrones didn't do that. Game of Thrones was like, no, you just got invested in this character. You love this character. I'm taking him away. Sorry. (laughs) And and it's really upsetting. (laughs) Yeah. Like, you know, you thought this was the, it would be like James Bond dying in the first 10 minutes of a James Bond movie. You're like, what the hell is this? This is amazing. And then it's some, somebody else's movie, you know? So, um, yeah, well, that's, you know, but then again, Harry Potter had a happy ascending after, you know, and that was a big, big hit. But yeah, but but even like like Lord of the going back to Lord of the Rings, like I felt that the use of the eagle army was his ex machina. Like why yeah. couldn't the just, <laughs> why couldn't the eagles have taken the ring? Okay, well because the Hobbit is the only one innocent enough. Okay, we'll have them ride the back of the eagles. No, 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 because then there wouldn't be a story. Okay, well at least tell us something about why the eagles don't want to do it. Just. One line. They're dumbasses. They just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just they're stupid. I don't know, but they come to the rescue at the end, don't they? Because they needed a quick back way back to Hobbitville, yeah. so the eagles come and rescue them. So it's like you got this eagle army, and yet it's it's sort of like you're you're not using them most of the time, just when they're in an emergency. When it's con- <laughs> when it's convenient for the story, and that that, that was something that it was sort of like yeah. Well, they, you know, yeah. Back many years ago, I read. Uh, I think it was translation of some Victor Hugo novels, especially uh, mm. Les Miserables. And mm. he shamelessly resorts to MacGuffins and, you know, mm. cheap uh, plot devices. <laughs> One of the greatest novels ever written, yes, yeah, <laughs> arguably, but... Uh, right, and, but I think that that time is changing. At least it is for me. I can't, if it's predictable, I can't. Like, I haven't watched a James Bond movie since Octopussy because I just know no matter what kind of trap the villain puts him through, he's getting out. It's, he's getting it's out. A formula. He's, he's getting out. He's getting laid. Yeah, and he's gonna. <laughs> yep, yep, and he's gonna win. He's gonna win. Uh, he's gonna, kill he's gonna save the crown. Right. He's gonna save the crown, and and he's gonna win. So the formula is getting old. So in, yeah. in writing my own stories, <laughs> I have to. I I personally want to break from that formula, and so if the reader comes away unhappy with me because they're sad. I've still given you something you didn't expect, and I'm okay with that. Yeah, well, you know, Thomas Hardy wrote a lot of sad novels and did well. <clears throat> yeah, and it doesn't necessarily have to be sad. Surprising is really what I'd rather have. Surprising, I don't yeah. want, I don't, I don't, like, I'll watch a superhero movie. I know, I already know at the end, Spider Man's going to beat the villain. I already know it. I just know it. I th- maybe that's why Rocky was so great, because at the end of Rocky, the first one, anyhow, he doesn't win. You're expecting him to win, he doesn't. You know, so um, or or like even Jaws, you know, Jaws. Uh, yeah, even though Roy Schneider ends up taking out Jaws, Jaws you know, Jaws kind of wiped everybody out. You know. Yeah. Wow. So. So anyhow, hey, thanks okay. for having well, me. Well, yeah, it was been fun, and uh, we'll probably have you back someday, uh, maybe for a live, a live thing. 
where people ask yeah. questions. I was hoping there would be more what? questions. There were, uh, as far as I know. Uh, yeah, I didn't see anything in the Twitterverse either, but uh, you know, it was a last-minute thing that threw well, out there. Well, so. we'll get we'll get questions next time. Uh, yeah, and uh, so uh, take care, and we'll uh, thanks for being on API Case Files uh, conversations, and uh, we'll see you soon. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Paul. Okay. Have a Bye. good night. Cheers. So that's the end of part two of my two-part conversation with Eric Wojciechowski. You should check out some of the stuff he's written. Yes, he is a skeptic and has written for publications like Skeptic Magazine, but he has been on the believer side, as he has said in part one. He was an ancient astronaut believer at one point and came to the conclusion that that was bogus only after a lot of careful and thoughtful research into the topic. And I think you'll find it, if you read Chasing Disclosure, you'll find a lot of references to the whole Sitchin mythos, which you might find interesting, even knowing that the author no longer accepts it. As always, you'll want to check out the links in the show notes at apicasefiles.com. And there are also some show notes. If you use a mobile player, you'll see that in your in the links in, in your player and the show under show notes. A couple of other quick notes before we go. Uh, API case files. Our primary podcast is primarily based on actual cases that we have investigated. Some result in no identification. Some do. We, we cover both types of cases and including the ones that are kind of, in between and fuzzy. And we will have, we often have witness audio. So you can actually hear the witness in their own words describing what they experience. We also do video case summaries. And quite often the case summary will go, be gone into a much more depth in the podcast. So you're going to want to check out the upcoming API case files. And there will be, we, we try to put out about four of those a year. And I know this is the first conversation in about a year since Kenny Biddle, but we're going to try to have many more and it won't all be skeptics. I, I promise there will be many different points of view represented. I have a couple of people in mind right now, including a guy who's very much kind of considered a friendly voice on the fence between the skeptics and the believers. And um, hopefully he'll be on soon. So, Hang in there and subscribe to the podcast. If you're using iTunes or whatever it is you're using, you can. There's probably a very simple subscribe button you can hit and get on. And when every time there's a new conversation or API case files episode, you'll get a notification of that. Also, if you have had a sighting that you would like to hear covered on API case files. It's a two-step process. First, you report it, and when we investigate it, and when that's complete, then we'll go on to the podcast. With it. And with your permission, we will use your voice explaining your own experience. If you don't want us to do that, we won't. It's only with witness permission that we ever use any audio from the investigation. But if that's what you want, by all means, go to reportaufo.org, and we'll put you in the queue, and it could be very soon that we have your voice uh, on API case files telling us what happened to you. If you'd like to be a guest on API Conversations, don't hesitate to contact us. You can write uh, to us uh, on email, apicasefiles at gmail.com, or you can contact us on Twitter at API case files. We also have a Discord channel, and you can also contact us through encrypted email, report a UFO at protonmail.com. So that's it. And so 
We'll see you again next time on API Conversations. And API Conversations is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike License. The music in this episode has been by DJ Spooky and George Hrab. This has been API Conversations number 17. skeptic I am You should believe what a skeptic I am Nope, nope, everybody adds the chow. There's... <laughs> Take take the chow part and just put an O there. It's Wojo House.